There is one such gentleman on the national housing stage now, Mr. Speaker, and I refer to a Mr. Hoogstra. There are people operating just as bad as Mr. Rachman ever was at this very moment. And uh, the Honourable Member for Mid Staffordshire mentioned the name of one of them. We should name those who are in the business of exploiting and oppressing their tenants. And of those, the worst is the man Hoogstra. Nicholas Hoogstra, and where he likes to be, abused in Parliament, in the news, and in a Bond Street jewellers. He's Britain's most feared landlord. Well, unusually for an emerald, it has fire, even. It has fire, it has clarity, it mm. is indeed a perfect stone. Mm. And I was pushed by Nicholas Hoogstra down my garden, back towards the door to my flat. And he said, get back in there, your property ends there. And he spat in my face again. So I believe that... Which you agree, it follows that the uh, better quality is in your right hand. Which is probably about half a million a piece. That's, uh, you're, you're a very good judge. Very good indeed. Well, I know him to be a very dangerous, ruthless man. I suppose at, at one time I was in... in uh, I was lucky to, to have escaped with my life. I mean, apart from the fact that I love them, they're beautiful. Um, I started buying them originally as, as a way of getting rid of spare money. His property empire is founded on fear and what he calls thieving. A prison chaplain described him as a self-imagined agent of Beelzebub, but a decent man underneath. I'm probably ruthless and I'm probably violent. I suppose like everybody, I regret, regret having um, made certain mistakes, yes. You say you don't get caught anymore? Um, you could say that, yes. Are you doing the One same? is clever enough to organise things in such a fashion that um, the, um, the chickens don't come home to roost. What kind of things uh, are you not being caught at? Well, you don't seriously expect me to answer that, do you? Twenty years ago, Nicholas Hoogstraten first made headlines after paying a Brighton thug to throw a grenade into the house of a man who he claimed owed him money. The thug's services cost £50, but the crime cost Hoogstraten four years in jail. Since then, he has built up a huge property empire in London and on the south coast, and a frightening reputation. Earlier this year, Kensington Council tried to jail him for allegedly harassing tenants in half a dozen houses, but the jury found him not guilty. Now Nicholas Hoogstraten's name is in the news again. Today, Parliament passes the last stages of a housing bill that will reduce controls on private landlords. Hoogstraten is spoken of as the epitome of the ruthless landlord who will exploit the new laws. Tonight's World in Action is a profile of the man, made with his cooperation. We can only speculate about his motives for cooperating. Ego? A calculation that it will be good for business to reinforce his vicious reputation? We don't know. Our motive was to discover how men like Hoogstraat can get around the law and get rich, and to uncover how he deals with tenants who get in his way. Our tour with Nicholas Hoogstraat began at the site of what is to become his personal palace. It's to be built at the cost of five million pounds on the site of a burnt-out Victorian mansion near the town of Uckfield in Sussex. Talking about the house in the pen. Well, the boathouse is going into this piece over here, yeah. and then halfway between here and the top, we're building the palace, which is mainly um, an art gallery for the furniture collection. The furniture that's uh, in your other houses at the moment. Well, and in storerooms as well. Mm. That'll be worth a lot of money then. Uh, well, the house, the house, and the the house will be worth about 10 million and the furniture will be worth ooh, 30 million. How much are you worth? Um, certainly over 100 million. Pounds? Oh, yes. Thank wouldn't you. Be, wouldn't be Lira, would it? <laughs> the next stage on our tour was his secret office, furnished with part of his priceless collection of 18th century French furniture. Uh, well, this particular piece is 1775-1780. Um, Sev plaques, um, satin wood, which would have come in, I presume, in those days from one of the French colonies. And the base is oak, and this hard, this wood here is mahogany. How much is it worth? Oh, um, 
something over 50,000, but if it went to auction, it would, could, would fetch maybe 150. What's your favourite piece? Uh, in this particular room, I think probably my favourite piece is the one over here, but um, mainly because of the story behind how I obtained it. <laughs> um, which uh, it was in fact thieved um, from the antique boys without them realising what they were selling. It's uh, Louis XV from uh, one of the royal palaces. If it went to auction, it would fetch at least 250. Maybe 50,000 pounds? Yes. Mm. Some people might think that uh, some of the pieces are a bit over the top. Well, they probably are, but they're not bomb over the top, aren't they? So everything about you is uh, gaudy or...? Don't use words like that. <laughs> well, how would you describe them? How would you describe you? Well, I don't see any onyx tables here. <laughs> Nicholas Hoogstraten will do a lot for money. David Harris is his ex-accountant. After Hoogstraten left prison, he believed that Harris had stolen money from him. He took violent revenge. We wanted to meet Harris, and Hoogstraten himself arranged it. The interview that followed was very unusual. It began with Harris telling how he was kidnapped. I was bundled into the boot of my own Rolls Royce and uh, transported off to Paris. That's 1971. You were bundled off by Mr. Hoogstraten personally? Yes, and a couple of henchmen. They took you to Paris. What do you think was going to happen? Well, they said I was there to work, to pay off this vast debt. This debt that turned out to be a hundred times more than I'd ever owed him. Where were you kept in Paris? Well, I was... I was in Paris, in a Paris hotel for something like seven weeks. And they then moved me off to a, a flat. Why didn't you just run away? Well, I was told I'd be killed if I returned. Or a member of my family would be. And you believed that? Well, yes, I had to. I could always stick it in later. Anyway. Throughout the interview, Nicholas Hoogstraten was present, visibly enjoying himself. What else happened to you in Paris? Well, I was severely beaten up one day by Hoogstraten. He considered that the work wasn't sufficient one week and, uh, and, and that uh, it was my fault. So he beat you up? Quite badly, yes. Personally beat you up? Yes, personally, yeah. He's quite a, he's quite a, a strong, heavy man. And I suppose I just carried nine stone to his 14. People, many people, most people would consider him a dreadful man. Do you consider him despicable? Well, I wouldn't say despicable. Uh, I think he's just a ruthless, just a ruthless man. Harris finally fled to England and police protection. We have witnesses who confirm his story. He's paid Hoogstraten 140,000 pounds and been forgiven. Nicholas Hoogstraten was born 43 years ago and grew up in Littlehampton in Sussex. His first money-making venture was stamp collecting. By 14, he says, his stamp business was worth £30,000. His father was head waiter on the cruise line of the SS Andes. Young Nicholas joined the crew on trips to the West Indies. He left his life on England's south coast for the Bahamas, where he bought land cheaply just before the tourist boom. He landed on his feet. By his early 20s, he'd made a fortune and a judgment on life. The most serious lessons I learned in my early life, when I started to have substantial wealth, was that one could not trust any other people that normal members of the public or business people are led to believe they should trust, such as their professional advisors, solicitors, accountants, etc. Police even. Um, I learned very early on in life that all these people were hypocrites, bent, dishonest, perverted. So I learned from a very early age that the so-called people that one is brought up by various propaganda to regard as dishonest and criminals, etc., etc., were and still are the only people that one can rely on in this world. 
At 21, he was buying scores of houses round Brighton and the South East. His sidelines were nightclubs and antiques, sometimes stolen. He proclaimed himself Britain's youngest self-made millionaire. At 23, he was in prison, serving four years for the grenade attack on the house in Brighton and for receiving stolen silver. Out of all the people I'm involved with, I have a few violent associates. Yes, a few. But as I said, everybody can be brought to the point of violence, depending on the circumstances. Are they used for strong arm method? For strong arm? Sorry? Are they used for strong arm tactics or what? These these uh, heavyweights? Well, they're getting a bit old now, aren't they? Some of them. Some of the people you're referring to. And they go well, I, don't think, well, I don't think once people get to the age of about 40, you don't exactly call them as strong arm men, would you? Or getting involved in strong arm tactics, but there's always plenty of young blood coming up. You've got some young blood who... Well, I haven't, but down the line, obviously, we've got people we call on for, you know, things that need doing from time to time. Including uh, t things which uh, you wouldn't like to see the light of day? Well, things which I'm certainly not going to discuss on television, no. <laughs> Violent things? Well, I'm not even going to answer that. I mean, one keeps one's insurance policies up to date. 46, five, thank you. 47, madam. 47, 47, five, 48. 48, 5, Nicholas Hoogstraten believes in the survival of the fittest. He offered to give us his guide to the world he thrives in, beginning at a London property auction where he claims to have made many a killing. 56, 5, new place on my right for the first time. At 56, 5, for the second time. Third and last time you're done. Sold 56, 5. Well, one, one, one comes here hoping to thieve a, thieve a property. I mean, I do. I'm not suggesting everybody else wants to do that. They come here to earn a living, but I'm only interested in if I can thieve something. What do you mean by thieve? Well, if I can't thieve it, I don't want it. Well, buy something for less than half what it's worth, basically. Uh, one cannot do that with residential tenanted property anymore. Consequently, I'm not in that market. I'm in the commercial market now. Trying to thieve commercial property? Well, not trying to. I am successfully doing it. And this has been the secret of your success over the last 20 years? Thieving properties? Yeah. Well, one of them, yes. What do you mean? Thieving anything, if you like. I mean, I'm in the stamp business, I'm in the diamond business, I'm in all sorts of businesses, but I'm only interested in thieving things. I'm not interested in buying something and making 10% on it. There are a lot of tenants come along here. What chance do you think they've got of buying their property? Normally very little. They come along and you're thinking, my God, I've been living in here for a long time, I can buy it cheap, they've got very little chance. Why have they got rid of it? Well, well, certainly I would never allow a tenant to buy a property and most of the dealers would tell you the same thing. Why not? Well, we, just, we just don't like tenants buying properties. What have you got against them? Well, I don't think any landlord likes a tenant. <laughs> you don't like a tenant? I certainly don't like tenants. How would you sum up tenants? Scumbags. Why? How are these scumbags? Well, because they're being subsidised by the remainder of the population, namely the landlords. So you really dislike them? Despite his hatred for tenants, Hoogstraten claims that he charges rents below the market price. The profit is in knowing when to buy a building and when to sell. What kind of categories were there? What kind of people get involved in buying property? Or well, got involved uh, in buying not property? generally like me. I mean, I only bought for long-term investment. I bought because I could see that I was paying less than the scrap value of the buildings. You're buying something for less than its scrap value. You don't have to do anything with it. You just sit on it and sooner or later you're going to realise your value. When the tenants move? Um, that's me. But Obviously, most people are in the business because they want to earn their wages. They've got their mortgages to pay and they've got their wives to keep and all the other things they get involved in. So, if they buy buildings, they've basically got to get BP. They Big position. Yes, they can't sort of rely on getting a rental income like I can on this one I just mentioned to you, £20 a week. Nobody else would suffer an income of £20 a week on an asset that was worth 300000 would they? So they have to get I mean, the tenants out? At that sort of margin, it's worth sort of sending somebody around to bump the person off, isn't it? Does that happen? Well, I, I don't honestly know of any cases where it has done, but it'd be a lot easier than robbing a bank, wouldn't it? If one was that way inclined. If you buy a building and can't get vacant possession, there are experts who will help you out. Well, a winkler is a person who basically hasn't got any money. He's um, a person who will be employed by the dealer to go and winkle out the tenant which means going round and uh, 
finding out if the tenant can be bought out, basically. If the Winkle link doesn't work, there are other ways of persuading them to go. Mm. Now, what ways? Well, everything from taking the roof off to um, making sure they meet with a nasty accident along the road. That I mean, really happens? Uh, well, I'm not going to go into the details of it, but, I mean, one does know about these things, yes. And with the amount of money involved, I mean, are you surprised that it happens? Luke Stratton claims that most of his tenants have no trouble from him and don't even know he's their landlord. It's when they annoy him or he wants the property emptied that things happen. He wants an old couple out of their flat in this house. Without them, it's worth over a million pounds as a development site. He mended their roof so that the rain poured in. To get an old woman out of the first floor flat in this house, he waited until she was in hospital and demolished the staircase. There are many similar stories which we could tell. This is Little Venice in London, so sought after that a vacant flat can be worth half a million pounds, especially if it has a garden. Like this one. For 20 years it's been accepted as the garden to Jackie Hope's flat, but then a company associated with Hoogstraten took over the building and Nicholas Hoogstraten himself put in an appearance. I walked out into the garden and walked towards them and said, excuse me, are you from the managing agent? And Nicholas Hoogstraten spat in my face and pushed me. He spat in your face? Yes. And he said, I'm the owner. Get your things out of here. So I said, I'm sorry. Um, this is my garden. You'll have to deal with my solicitor. And the man who was with him, who I know now to be Robert Bradshaw, said, you won't need a solicitor, you'll need a doctor, because you're going to end up in a wheelchair, and if you're in a wheelchair, you won't be able to get into your garden, will you? So, again, I said, I'm sorry, you'll have to deal with my solicitor. And I was pushed by Nicholas Hoogstraten down my garden, back, towards the door to my flat and he said get back in there your property ends there and he spat in my face again and this woman who I'd never met in my life before or since uh, came up to me and said something to the effect of what was I doing in the garden so I said what are you doing in the garden get you arse out of it and she said oh it's my garden something to that effect I mean how can a tenant ever think that a garden belongs to them in any event, but I then said, uh, I said, well, I, I was a bit more, uh, um, what's the word, a bit more blunt to her. I told her in no uncertain terms they could ask out the garden. And she still sort of wanted to carry on interfering with what myself and I think somebody else was with me were doing. So I then spat on her. You spat on her? Mm. So then she disappeared, and she did go, she did leave the garden. Mm. Are you proud of it? Well, not proud of it, but I mean, it had the desired effect, doesn't it? And then he called me vile names. What did he say? Well, he called me a cow and a slut and a filthy something other, I don't remember. You must um, have been very frightened. I was. I was shocked and terrified. And then he said, did I know who I was dealing with? And I said, you told me you were the owner. And then the other man who was with him, Robert Bradshaw, said, I'm the new owner and I'm going to move in beneath you. And when I do, your life won't be worth living. Bradshaw did move in. Over the next six months, nails were hammered through her door. There were thefts and the garden was damaged. The climax came when a tenant's rights official tried to photograph Bradshaw. I saw Robert Bradshaw walking down my garden, moving my garden furniture. And Robert Bradshaw looked up and saw Paul and said, what are you doing? So Paul said, I've come to photograph Mrs. Hope's garden. And Robert Bradshaw then bent down to pick up a piece of the broken concrete and shouted, come down here, you f***. 
And then with great violence and force, he threw the concrete directly at Paul's head. And I managed to shout, Paul, duck, which he did. So, and we were turning and running to get away, and the concrete caught him on the hand. Then, without warning, Bradshaw disappeared. He'd been jailed for 13 years for armed robbery. After your confrontation with her in the garden, Mr. Bradshaw, one of your associates' friends. I'm not answering or having any involvement with any direct questions concerning other people. I will tell you everything you want to know about me, but not concerning other people, so don't ask me any questions about anybody else. You wouldn't answer any questions about Mr. Bradshaw? No. Do you know of what occurred between him and her subsequently? Uh, only round the houses, yes. I mean, I don't directly know, no. So again, I'm not really in a position to answer any questions about that either. Why won't you answer questions about you and Bradshaw? Well, because I'm not going to... It's quite correct for myself, because of the position I'm in, not to deal with any matters concerning innocent third parties. You mean him? Well... Uh, He's doing innocent third 13 parties. years for armed robbery. We don't want any of that, do we? Since her interview, there have been threats to Jackie Hope. She's fled from her home and is under police protection. Three miles away in Shepherd's Bush, a contract got rid of another tenant. Today, she's in a nursing home on the south coast where she doesn't want to be identified. Her troubles began when she had to go into hospital suffering from multiple sclerosis. While she was receiving treatment, Hoog Stratton phoned with a made-up story that her flat was flooded. She sent him a key. It was a ploy to get all my possessions out of my flat so you could have vacant possession for the whole house. So nothing would be uh, obvious that I was there, a tenant, sitting tenant. He wanted the flat totally vacant. Uh, so that nothing he... in it. And what would he do then? He's going to sell the house. So you were in, in his way? I was in his way. I was still paying rent them every month on the, on the button. The first of every month. He lost her you home. think the landlord's not entitled to take back his property if he wants to? At any moment, when the woman's in hospital, she's well, paying her I'm rent. I'm concerned about this. She wasn't paying rent. She was paying £12 a week. That's hardly rent, is it? For a self-contained luxury flat in Holland Park. That is not rent. She was taking a piss from her hospital bed. She was taking a piss. And I'm not going to stand for it. I think that's disgusting. Well, it's hard luck. I'm sorry you think that way. Have you done worse things than that to people? What, you think? <laughs> How can you think that that's a terrible thing? Oh my God, what, the landlord taking back his own property? The house was sold to people who had no idea there was a sitting tenant. When the tenant objected, Hoog Stratton's agents warned that if she made trouble, she'd lose her belongings as well as the flat. She read us the agent's letter. You would well be advised to let sleeping dogs lie as we are well used to dealing with the nonsense caused by tenants who one minute are grateful for somewhere to live at a rock-bottom rent and the next minute seek compensation from the owner. What did you feel when you read that letter? I felt totally threatened and ill by his, his, this letter. Where were you when you received it? I was in the nursing home. What do you think of that letter? To a sick well, woman. Hang on, hang on, it's quite a long letter. What, well, do you want me to read the last paragraph? Which if you I like. think sums up our attitude generally to tenants anyway. You would be well advised to let sleeping dogs lie, as we are well used to dealing with the nonsense caused by tenants who one minute are grateful for somewhere to live at a rock bottom rent, rent in inverted commas, and the next minute seek compensation, in inverted commas, from the owner. Compensation for what? An eight years subsidised flat in Holland Park. Who is trying to kid whom? I mean, that's. I think they've. Oh, well, I'd, I'd see whose reference it is. I think they've done very well. You were in bed, you were in hospital at the time? I was in, in... I was bed. When you read that letter, why do you think they wrote that letter? To threaten me. Terrible thing, isn't it? Hey? I think it's pretty bad. Yeah, well, you would, because you weren't the landlord. It wasn't your property. She lost her whole. It wasn't life. your house, was it? It's easy for you to stand there postulating about it. It wasn't your property. 
and property is king. Well, isn't that what life's all about? The new housing bill debated in the Commons today will make life easier for private landlords. It has provisions to curb landlords like Nicholas Hoogstraten. However, he told us that he thinks the new bill is a step in the right direction. in action would like to pay tribute to cameraman John Gibson who died in a helicopter accident on another assignment shortly after filming this program.